Museum, a past a board member, and Patrick was an exploration geologist who did, became very interested in, in the meteorites, became an avid student of meteorites and a collector of meteorites, and he was instrumental in developing our meteorite exhibit out, uh, out in the museum. So we're delighted to have him today to talk to us about why we should be interested in meteorites. Patrick, let's give him a hand. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I should kind of summarize my qualifications. As an astronomer, I make a sometimes reliable geology. We're going to talk today about asteroids and why we should care. We're going to answer the question, why should we care about asteroids? And I thought it would be appropriate to start for those of you of a certain age, you'll recognize Alfred E. Newman from the early Mad Magazine. My goal today is to just answer this question, why we should care to learn about meteorites and study them. And I don't want anyone leaving fearful of asteroids. And I don't want anyone fearful of asteroid impacts. So, if that's where you are at the end, come see me and I'll try to allay your fears. We don't need to worry about that. So here we go on our, on our journey. To answer the question, we should care about asteroids because of this guy. This is, as you know, Stephen Hawking, the British uh, physicist and astronomer. Do you want to come in and find a seat? Um, he, his quotation here uh, makes it a fairly serious topic. One of the major threats to intelligent life, assuming we're intelligent, is the high probability of an asteroid colliding with inhabited planets. So he was one of the founders of International Asteroid Day. What are asteroids? Many of you already know, but let's, let's uh, cover that one more time. They're very similar to leftovers your mother used to put in Tupperware in the refrigerator. <laughs> they're leftovers from the formation of our solar system. So they're chunks of rock too small to either be planets, dwarf planets, moons, but these things still orbit the sun in the same direction as we orbit the sun. And they're very, very cold and very, very old. In fact, those of you who know the age of the Earth, that's slightly older than the age of the Earth. Asteroids are usually cratered. Some have moons and rings. Uh, some even have tails, but there's a little bit of an overlap between asteroids and comets. They range in size from 525 kilometers in diameter down to dust sized particles. So big range in size. The difference between them and comets you can see here. Um, really the easy way to think of asteroids is they're the rocky leftovers closer to the sun. Comets are the dirty snowballs that are further away that form out further in the solar system. And comets as we all probably know, have a tail when they're close to the sun. And the reason they have a tail is the solar wind coming off the sun blows the, uh, the fine material, the dust, and the evaporating gas out in a tail-like structure. And the tail always points away from the sun. Doesn't, so comets don't necessarily have a tail that follows them. It's a tail that points away from the sun as they orbit around. Okay. Um, the other thing is, of course, meteorites orbit faster. Comets are further out. Bigger size, size range in, in, I'm sorry, asteroids. I sometimes substitute the word meteorite for asteroid. I apologize. Okay. Oop, we'll go back one. So where are the asteroids? Now this is really hard to see, and it's pretty much impossible to draw our solar system to scale. 
but this is kind of an attempt kind of in between. Um, these are the planets here, Mercury, and then Venus, and then Earth, and then Mars orbiting the Sun in the middle. So the main asteroids occur in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. So Mars is here, and Jupiter is orbiting out here. Um, and we also have, in addition to the one million plus asteroids that are in the asteroid belt, and those are uh, just, we're just counting those that are larger than a kilometer in diameter. So these are just the big ones. There's many, many more little ones. Okay, we also have Trojan asteroids. And Trojan asteroids are the ones that are orbiting in the same path the same orbital plane as the planets. And all of the planets have Trojan asteroids except Mercury and Saturn. And the reason Mercury doesn't have Trojans is it's so close to the sun, the sun pulls all those off. The reason Saturn doesn't have them is it's so close to Jupiter, and Jupiter is so massive it pulls the uh, asteroids off. So. Now, the ones we're really concerned with <laughs> that you'll hear a lot about are the near-Earth asteroids or the near-Earth objects because they include some comets in there. Um, there's about 31,000 of those that we've found so far that are at least 140 meters in, in diameter. And what happens is you'll have an asteroid that maybe normally rotates out here and part of its, its uh, rotation takes it closer to the Earth, closer to the Earth's rotation. If it's within about 28 million miles, it's called a near-Earth asteroid, or three-tenths of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay. Oop. Yikes. They travel really fast, really fast. The muzzle velocity of a hunting rifle is about 3,400 kilometers per hour. That's about 3,171 feet per second. Um, and meteorites are between 10 times that speed and 80 times that speed. And the easy way to think of it is the Earth is traveling really fast. The Earth is traveling at 108 kilometers per hour. So we're really screaming around. And some of these uh, asteroids uh, intersect the Earth's path at, uh, on average, about uh, 72,000 kilometers per hour. Most of you know what happens when they impact, um, and this is why I kind of go back and forth with terminology. But when you have an asteroid traveling through the Earth's atmosphere, it, uh, it has enough friction on it to cause it to um, ignite and uh, catch fire. And that fireball that we see um, is termed a meteor or a bolide or a shooting star. All of those are just these asteroids passing through our atmosphere, and, and that's what we see. The medium ones can explode in the atmosphere, and fragments can fall to the Earth, and medium ones being up to about 25 meters in diameter. So it's a medium asteroid. The very large ones explode violently on the ground, make big craters. They're the bad guys. We don't like those guys. Okay, so what is the evidence for these impacts on the Earth? Well, there isn't a lot of evidence on the Earth. We've only found 190 craters on, on our planet. We've found a million on the moon, 635,000 on Mars. Uh, all the other objects in our solar system are cratered like crazy. Moons, uh, all the Earth planets, um, all the asteroids themselves are cratered. So why only 190 on Earth? Anybody have an idea? 
She's right. Yeah, the, the, there's a number of reasons. First of all, the Earth's atmosphere protects us from the little asteroids. The bulk of our planet is covered in water, but the real reason that we find so few craters is the hydrologic cycle. We have erosion and deposition going on, like a giant eraser erasing all these craters all the time, so we, have, we don't find them. And also global tectonics, seafloor spreading, subduction, mountain building, that whole process also helps to erase evidence of craters. Now let's talk about the ones we do find. 10 years ago, you probably saw this on television. Yeah, Chelyabinsk. And this is in Russia, uh, the southern Ural region, happened on February 15th, um, uh, an asteroid that was 18 meters in diameter uh, came through the atmosphere, became a meteor as it passed through the atmosphere, and then it exploded in the atmosphere high up, about 23 kilometers in the, in the air. And fortunately, that was a little bit away from the central part of Chelyabinsk and also high up because the energy released was 26 to 33 times Hiroshima. So that was bad and that was 10 years ago. If that had landed in Chelyabinsk at a, high, at a more direct angle, it, the consequences would have been much worse. There were 1,500 people injured, mostly by flying glass, 7,200 this one, part of the wall and the roof collapsed. Many of you have been to Beringer Crater. This one, yeah, this one happened 50,000 years ago, northern Arizona. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's a fun place to visit. The asteroid, it was almost 50 meters. The crater is about 1.2 1 kilometers. Um, and this was 150 times Hiroshima. This is a parking lot here, this square thing, and those little white dots are Winnebago's for scale. <laughs> so, we're here talking today because of this impact event, Tunguska, which also was in Russia, and this happened 115 years ago Friday. And so that's why International Asteroid Day is, is uh, re recognized on that day. We think the impactor might have been about 65 meters in diameter. It flattened 80 million trees, 80 million trees over an area about 40 kilometers in one direction and 50 kilometers in the other direction. So 40 by 50 kilometers. Big area, 80 million trees is a lot. We estimate 333 times the energy of Hiroshima. Where's the crater? It hit way above and exploded in the air. There is no crater, and we've looked a lot in many different ways. We think there are a couple theories. One theory is that this is similar to the, the impactor hit at a low angle, and so it went a long way through the atmosphere, exploded in the atmosphere, and caused all this happening reach the Earth to make a crater. The other possibility is that that impactor was fairly lightweight, perhaps a comet, rather than uh, an asteroid. And if it was a comet, a dirty snowball, it had maybe less mass, and so then you have uh, you have more play on the angle at which it could come in, into the atmosphere. So, two theories. Could I ask why uh, it explodes? Is it the friction in the atmosphere? Yeah, good question. Um, these things are traveling super fast, and there is a huge amount of friction, and finally they reach a point where the, the energy they've generated is just so great that they just explode. So. That's, that's it. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, 
So the answer to why we should care, we're still unprepared. And on, in June of 2018, the National Science and Technology Council warned that we're still unprepared. However, we're working on it. We're working hard on it. And you probably have seen some of the things we've prepared. We're going to talk about a sampling of our search and monitoring projects. The first one is this one, the Catalina Sky Survey near Tucson on Mount Lemmon, run by the University of um, it's, a, it's doing great work all the time. I went to the Pan-SARS Observatory on Haleakala last year. Didn't have a pass to get in, but got close. <laughs> um, and most, many of you know about NEOWISE, which is the uh, space telescope that's, that's operating in infrared wavelength, which is the best way to find these things. They show up much better in the infrared than in visible spectrum. So that's uh, helping us a lot. Um, some more telescopes we have, the Subaru uh, Telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. European Space Agency's test bed one and two. One is in Spain, two is in Chile. This one's really useful. The US Department of Energy Dark Energy Camera in Chile it's spotting the, the asteroids that are close to the sun that we've had trouble spotting because, you know, seeing something come out from, yeah, very, very close to the sun. And those are really helping. This big thing under construction by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy and private money in Chile will be done here. And this is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And this is an amazing uh, optical instrument. It will greatly aid us in finding uh, more asteroids. You have an assignment between now and when we ask questions. I want you to tell me who Vera C. Rubin is and why we should care about her. OK. <laughs> um, Everybody, no, you don't have to all get your phone out. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so these are spacecraft missions to study astronauts. We've got a lot of them. The first one was Galileo on its way to Jupiter. Then we had uh, near Shoemaker, which landed on Eros, uh, first, first landing on an asteroid. We've had Japanese uh, projects, Hayabusa 1 and 2. And this year, you're going to hear a ton about Os Osiris Rex. And the reason you're going to hear so much about it in September of this year, samples from Bennu, the, the asteroid Bennu, will be returned to Earth. They're going to land in Utah, be trucked down to Houston to a clean lab, and they're going to go over those. So that's pretty exciting. OK. Most of you are familiar with the DART mission last year. Um, the, uh, in, in that mission, we had a spacecraft collide with Dimorphos, which was an asteroid that was a moon or a satellite to another asteroid. So it was rotating around the other asteroid. And the, the goal was to slow down the rate of revolution in that impact. So we were hoping to if we can influence these things, kind of control them in case they're coming towards the Earth. Also, uh, we launched in 2021 Lucy, which when it's there, we'll explore those trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Uh, Psyche, which uh, we'll be launching later this year, we'll explore um, the, the asteroid Psyche, and we hope. Um, we hope that the, it is a metallic asteroid. We're not, we, we believe it to be, but until you get there, you never know. Um, and Hera uh, is another mission planned to follow up on DART and look at Dimorphos more closely and see what the impact looked like and see exactly what happened. So that'll be launching in 2024. Finally, this one, the Neo Surveyor. This is this is 
wonderful thing. Hopefully it'll happen. 2027 is the plan. It will be able to find, and of course, NASA says only 67% of near Earth objects because they don't want to, they don't want to admit to what Congress wants. Congress wants 95% of near Earth objects. Uh, so I think that will happen, but of course, NASA is their numbers low. We're finding all these things. Okay, the, the red line here are the big ones, greater than a kilometer in size. We didn't even know they existed until late 90s. We basically think we've found most of those because that line is pretty flat. As you can see, we're finding the ones that are 140 mil meters or bigger really fast, and the little tiny ones, you know, we're finding super fast. Um, and that'll continue. So hopefully someday out in the future, all those lines will be flat, we'll have found them all. Okay, um, I want to tell you the story of uh, one discovery we made, and this is uh, Almohada Siddha, the Almohada Siddha meteorite, which in 2008 was called TC3. Um, and Richard, Richard Kowalski uh, went, to, went to work in the morning at the Catalina Sky Survey, and the computer was flashing red, and he went, uh-oh. And what it said was the distance that this would pass from Earth was zero, zero, zero. He went, uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, he made a bunch of phone calls and within the next 19 hours, there were 586 observations by people all around the planet. And they predicted exactly where and when this fortunately very small asteroid, it's only four meters or 13 feet, would hit. And it hit just where exactly where they had calculated in the north of Sudan, right here. And uh, this man, um, Peter Jeniskins, uh, organized a group of people go out and pick up all the meteorites that fell after it exploded in the air. This is, and you guys can look at this after the talk, this is the Al Almohada Siddha meteorite. And I don't have a very big slice because this is a very expensive meteorite. Um, and uh, the neat thing about it, it has micro diamonds in it. And micro diamonds, when you look at them under a microscope, they had to have formed under a lot of pressure for a long time. And so we think that uh, this formed Mercury to Mars size protoplanet that no longer exists in our solar system. So it's very, very cool. The first one, we, we figured out where it was going to hit, and we went out, and it, it did it. So that was nice. So all of this is in the past. We don't have to worry, right? OK. Oh, International Meteorite Day, we had 23, 2020 MZ5 went by. 629,000 miles, pretty far. The moon's about 250,000 miles, so it's twice the distance to the moon and a little more, so no worries. It was 20 meters in diameter. Yesterday, we had a 25 meter uh, asteroid go by at 1,360,000 miles. Today, today, we have a big one, 119 meters do a big number. That's about uh, more than double the size of the one that me made Meteor Crater in Arizona. So uh, it went by about 3 million miles, though, so that's a long ways out. And then tomorrow, there's a 13-meter one that's coming a little closer, 685,000 miles. And on the 5th of July, day after uh, Independence Day, we have 170 meter, a super big one, the size of a skyscraper, going by way out at about a million two hundred thousand miles. So, kind of exciting. It's happening right now, in real time. 
the good news. Astronomers have mapped the paths of near-Earth objects larger than a kilometer. None of them will hit the Earth in the next hundred years. None of them. And to the extent we can calculate, none of them will hit in the next thousand years either. Um, there are some variables, and we can't say that with 100% certainty because there are influence trajectories. So, um, The other bit of good news is that DART test was very successful. We had hoped, NASA had hoped to shorten the orbit by 73 seconds. 73 seconds would have been a positive test. 32 minutes is a that's really good and that's, that's definitely good news. Time humanity has changed the motion of a natural object in space. Okay, ooh, you can't read this very well. Too, I wish, uh, anyway. Um, what can you do? The first thing you can do is learn the truth. Use care in selecting your information sources. Hopefully, you know, you get your, your, your news from peer-reviewed scientific journals and things that are reliable. Um, because we know that there are diff different folks have different agendas and sometimes things that are out there are not necessarily true. Vote for candidates who support projects to protect the earth and advance scientific understanding. And here's a, here's a really interesting one. You don't even have to have a telescope to help if you want. If you want to be a citizen scientist and help in the hunt for near earth objects, you can do it by going to www.zooniverse.org and look for the Daily Minor Planet Project at the Catalina Sky Survey. Daily Minor Planet Project, Catalina Sky Survey. And you can be looking on, in different parts of the sky and you can help in finding these things. So it's kind of a neat deal. Okay, questions? Yes? So why are the asteroids leaving the asteroid belt? Are they being pulled out or pushed out by another Well, asteroid? asteroids are the ones that are near Earth. That's their orbit right now. In other words, their, their orbit isn't necessarily changing to come close to the Earth. It's their orbit that they're already in. Um, but there are lots of things that influence the orbits, of course, because gravity works. And so, you know, it, it, Jupiter's gravity influences a lot. The sun's gravity influences a lot. And we use, um, we use the fact that uh, gravity is, is such a big deal in our uh, trips into space. We, we slingshot, we go around a big planet or a big body and slingshot to go faster out into space. So a lot of these different missions were using the gravity of different planets. But uh, yeah, things can change and things can pull these out of orbit and they can crash into each other and be thrown into new, new directions too. I don't remember, but was Russia, did, did, were they planning for that 2013? No. Earth? No, that was a big surprise. It was you were you're kind of right in that um, uh, in 2013 we knew that there would be an asteroid come close to the Earth, and it was going to come close on the opposite side of the Earth, and that one came from where the sun is. We, nobody saw it. No astronomer saw it ahead of time. And boom, it was there and on everybody's cam. And there's a great movie about that here. At, it's, uh, there's a great movie video made about that that she, you know, I, can, I can give to you. And the, the, I think the museum here has a copy of that too. But if you want to learn more about Chelyabinsk. Also, I have a sample of it right here. This is Chelyabinsk for you guys who, if you want to take a look at it. So just come up afterwards. 
And the other thing that I forgot to say, when I talked about uh, chick lube, this is related to chick's lube. This is the brow horn off a triceratops. It was casually grazing out in eastern Montana when chick's lube came along, and it is no more. So there you go. And you can come up and look at that too. Did they, they come to a temple shuttle exploded back uh, a long way, but they were tracking the uh, debris path. And uh, so in 1833 or thereabouts in November, the whole thing made the whole sky come ablaze for several nights in a row. Do we still have uh, material coming in from that uh, November thing? Um, material coming in from that November thing. That's hard to say, but I will tell you this. Every day we get lots of micrometeorites and smaller meteorites landing on the Earth. In fact, if you were to guess, how much would you guess we get every day in terms of you know, five pounds, 10 pounds, 100 pounds? What do you think? I would say several tons. Several tons. It's the answer is 48 tons. Every day we have 48 tons of new material falling out of the sky on this planet. But it's mostly fine dust. Carol. Who is the Who is the Ah, I thought somebody would tell me. Clint knows, Clint. really close, uh, almost perfect. Um, she is the one who verified the existence of dark matter, dark matter. She did amazing things. She was looking at the rotation of galaxies and the galaxies were supposed to rotate at a certain speed and they were rotating at a speed less than or greater than the speed that they were supposed to rotate given the, the mass of all the stars that we could see. So she confirmed that there had to be this dark matter, this other stuff in the galaxy to cause the rotation to be different than it was supposed to be. So she is the one who confirmed it. Did she get the Nobel Prize for that? No, because she was a woman. No. Yeah, Boo is right. She was a pioneer. Absolutely. When was that? When did she make that discovery? I. Yeah, I think it was sixties or seventies, but I'm I don't know the exact date. Yeah, it, it would be 60s or 70s, and we can look that up. You guys can probably look it up faster than me. <laughs> All right, yes? What is dark matter? Uh, good question. It's, it's, it's matter that we can't see. It's matter that's not in the, that isn't um, visible to us for whatever reason. Right. It's just, we're just not getting any, any light from it for whatever reason. And so we don't know is the quick answer. It's just something that's there and we don't know beyond that. Seventies. Okay. Are we going to be able to see the person coming in in August? As long as we don't have fires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when they shot the rocket out and it hit that meteor, did it in fact change it? Did it slow it down? Or it did. did it, one way it did slow it down. And the reason we tested the double uh, action redirection test, the DART test, the reason we did that 
on that one was because it was orbiting another asteroid and it was easier to see a difference. And also we weren't um, likely to be changing the flight of one that's orbiting the sun that could cause problems. So we wanted to do it on one that was orbiting another asteroid so it could, we could see a difference more easily. And it was a small one and, and it, it, was, it worked. It was, worked, worked great. So. Yeah. Do you know what the like period of rotation was of that asteroid? I don't. I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't. So. so since they were able to slow that one down, does that mean that if one is coming towards the Earth, we'll be able to shoot something at it and deflect it away? We hope so. The, 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 the. There's two, two things that matter. Um, one is the mass of the, the asteroid. If it's a really massive one, uh, then it's important that we learn that it's headed our direction very, very early. If we learn about it early enough, it takes a tiny amount of, of change to change the direction. So the timing really matters and that's, yeah, the earlier we can learn about them, the better. I thought a long time ago we had a project that we could change the color of any of those asteroids. They turn them, you know, these, the principle of these little radiometers that you have the vacuum of space and you have the, the collection of what's the sunshine on one panel or the other, you like to return it. Well, isn't that one way to turn one of those things? Yeah, they've looked at all kinds of different methods and, and, you know, even talked about nuclear explosions and all kinds of things. Um, you know, if we can see something early enough, simple is better than complicated. <laughs> so, you know, if we can just hit it with some object, that's, that's easier than all the other possibles. Did a question over here. Why do we see more? Oh, oh, you mean the like the shooting stars, like yeah. the Perseids and so on. Those, those that, that we see are, and we can predict their arrival, they're usually a bunch of dust grains that are associated with um, a particular comet. And so those dust grains are going to hit at, on a certain time of, of the year, and we know that because we've calculated and it's it happens all you know year after year after year so you're looking at little tiny grains in fact a lot of those those shooting stars you see are little grains of sand coming through the atmosphere they look like they're a big amazing shooting star but it's a little tiny grain of sand that's lighting up so. Yeah, very. It's 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 very interesting. Hopefully, nobody's more afraid when they came in here because the, there's very low odds that about here. It's just they're very interesting. It's fun to study them, and that's that's all we. Yes. Steve touched on this before we started, but we have a very nice meteorite um, exhibit in the back of the museum. If you haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Nanhan meteorite that's probably this big that you can touch. Um, I think there's a piece of the Russia meteorite that you have as well, and a number of things that Patrick has donated as well to, to the museum. So you get a chance to take a look at it. Really yeah, the, the Nantan is an, is an iron meteorite, yeah. and those are, those are fun to look at. There's also a, there's sort of an interesting backstory I heard about the Nantan. Uh, it, was, uh, it was observed in China in 1513 because the Chinese record everything. So they had this big meteorite storm that came down. They recorded that, but they didn't find the impactor until the 1940s when they found actually pieces of a meteorite. <coughs> this was exactly the time when Mao Zedong was trying to industrialize 
China. And he was having all the uh, peasants melt down their uh, iron cookware, their plows, etc., to try and make steel, village steel. Well, it was a very inefficient process because they could never get the temperature high enough to really smell effectively. But he wanted to smelt the Nantan meteorite material. Luckily, it had too much nickel in it to be <laughs> smelted by the primitive process. So that's why worldwide we have lots of Nantan meteorites available. We have them to, to display like we do. And you can actually buy little bitty pieces on a gift shop. And I forgot to mention before, for those that have not been here before, we have a lovely gift shop that will be available to you. We have all kinds of wonderful earth science, educational materials, and locks and good stuff for the kids. And so we, we urge you to stop by there on your way uh, uh, as you visit the museum. Let's let's say that right now for give Patrick a little break. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he would be willing to stand uh, stay around for a little bit and answer individual questions. But uh, I invite you to visit the museum, visit the gift shop, and let's give Patrick another nice chance.